Namaste, YJA. I have to say, I um, I love YJA. I was I was at the first YJA convention in 1994 in Chicago. I don't think it gets any more old school than that. And then I went again in 2000 to YJA in Los Angeles. And YJA gave so much to me. I <clears throat> it deepened my connection to an ancient tradition, and it made me a part of a living community. And I have friends that I cherish to this day that I made through YJA. So I just want to give a huge shout out, much love, much respect to all the young people who are carrying that spirit forward. Um, I want to talk about environmental justice today, which is something that I think about every day and that sometimes shows up in my dreams as well. And to get it started, I wanted to do a little quiz with you guys. So, if you can see my screen, here's the first question. And I, and I think a poll is gonna pop up so you can click. I see the answers coming in. Looks like we have a majority so far for C. More answers is that, or if most people weighed in, a decent number of people are voting for D, 2.5 million. Let's see. The answer is correct, C, 8.7 million. So actually, yes, yeah, 69% of folks got that right. Um, that's the extent of the biodiversity on the planet that we, that we live on right now. Here's the next question. At the current rate, how many of those 8.7 million species are likely to go extinct by 2100? I can see the answers coming in. Thank you everyone for participating. Vishwa, why don't you go ahead and reveal what people have um, clicked on. So the, the, the um, once again, the room is on point. Here, let me click the next slide. It, indeed, it is 50%. I mean, I, and, and congratulations to the 52% of you who, um, who knew that, but it's a dark thing to know. It's, it's it, um, just hard to fathom that half the species on Earth would disappear this century. Um, here's the next question. <clears throat> when was the last time the Earth experienced a mass extinction of this scale? 60,000 years ago, 6 million years ago, 60 million years ago, 600 million years ago. Answers are coming in. Can Visual, can they see the answers as they come in or only I can? Uh, only you can. Okay. So you can see how someone's in the chat. Okay, why don't you go ahead and oh, I see you need to end the polling in order to show if them. The, yeah, if I end the polling, they can't answer anymore. So. Okay. I think we're still getting a few more. Folks are thinking about it. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and show everybody? Yeah, so as you guys can see, 47% um, of us said C, and indeed it's C. I'm impressed by how informed this crowd is. But that too is a daunting thing to, to grasp. I mean, we think of Jainism as an ancient religion. You know, the, the texts and the, the thinking goes back 3,000, maybe 4,000 years. 60 million years it's been since a change of this magnitude took place on the planet. So the, the changes that are happening right now, they are on an on a incredible um, time scale that, that is truly hard to imagine. And there have only been five others mass extinction events like this in the history of the planet. And all the other five were from external shocks, like an asteroid hit the Earth. This is the first time 
that residents of the earth, namely us, um, have, have, have wrought a change of this scale. Let me go to the next question. <clears throat> Why do scientists call the current geological era the Anthropocene? Is it A, because anthro is a layer of rock that has risen to the surface during this era? Is it B, because human activity is now the most powerful force shaping the planet? C, both of the above, D, neither of the above. Answers are flying in. When I did this with, with people in a, in a room, we had kind of letters on the wall and people walked to the A or the B or the C or the D, so they were voting with their feet. And one day we will be in a room together again, I, I'm, I'm confident. But I appreciate you guys working with us on this Zoom version in the meantime. Why don't we go ahead, Visha, and, and uh, show the poll. Once again, the YJA brainiacs have it correct. The reason scientists are calling this era the Anthropocene is because anthro means people, and this era, more than any other in the history of the planet, is shaped by people. The geological and environmental features of the world we live in are, are shaped primarily by the presence of humans. Next question. How many people today live with air that the WHO considers harmful to human health? I guess one thing I didn't say um, was, Let's um, have a gentleman's agreement not to Google the answers to these questions um, when, you, when you're clicking. Let's try to do these from, from memory. Answers are coming in. Anybody else? Still getting a few more. Okay, Vishal, why don't you go ahead and, and reveal. So the, 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 a plurality of us said B, 43%. The reality is worse. Um, I guess this is the first time that our community was, was a little off. According to the standards that the WHO sets around what constitute healthy air, 91% of human beings live breathing un unhealthy air the majority of their lives. Uh, so we, we have, a, we have a, in addition to a mass extinction crisis, we have a, we have a pollution crisis. Um, I'm gonna go to the next one. Okay, coming to climate change. You guys know about climate change. Scientists predict catastrophic consequences from climate change if the planet warms any more than a one and a half degrees. That includes extreme droughts, floods, heat waves, displacing and or impoverishing hundreds of millions of people. If we take into account all the pledges that were made by governments, including the ones that were made uh, at the Paris Agreement that was signed in 2017, what level of warming are we on track to experience? What are scientists projecting? And this, the answers are coming in. <clears throat> Still getting a few more. Anybody else? Speak now. Okay, Vishwa, let's, let's reveal. So a, about 40% of us said C, and indeed the answer is C, which again is, is, is a stark reality to contend with, that even with the Paris Agreement, even with the commitments that, that governments have made to date, if they were to live up to those, which itself is a question mark, because sometimes governments make commitments and aren't able to live up to them, if they were to live up to those, we are on course to far exceed what scientists agree would be catastrophic. <clears throat> okay, this is, this is the last question in the quiz. Who is hurt most by climate change and environmental destruction? Is it A, poor people? Is it B, people who have less political power? Is it C, people who have done relatively little to cause the harms in the first place? Or is it D, all of the above? Answers are flying in. Don't be shy. I can see how many people are answering, and I know that we've got, I believe we've got way more people on the, on the phone than are actually putting in answers, and so please do participate. 
Okay, Vishwa, let's reveal. This one, I think more than any other question we all agreed on. Um, and indeed, that is, that is why you need the word justice in the phrase environmental justice, because the harms that we are talking about, the crisis that we are talking about, um, it is not distributed equally. And one of the great cruel ironies of the time we live in is that the people who have often done the least to cause this problem are the ones who are likely to suffer the greatest. So I'm gonna keep moving. Thank you for taking part in that quiz. Should, be, should we be worried about this situation? I would submit that every single one of us should be extremely worried. Oops, let's see. Should we despair? <clears throat> In my view, despair is really not an option that we have. I love this quote from Bishop Desmond Tutu, who you, you may have heard of. He was one of the freedom fighters in, in South Africa who helped to achieve apartheid. And he himself is a religious leader. And he says, I'm not an optimist. You know, he's like, that's not really the question, optimism or pessimism, but I am a prisoner of hope. I can't let go of hope. That's the only way I know to live in the world. Um, and, and that's what I aspire to as well, is not despair, but, but hope. So, you know, kind of coming to the, the unique group of people that we are convened right now on this, on this, on this call, um, I do believe that Jane ethics can help us to reimagine the relationship between human beings and the natural world. How? Well, you know, one of the most famous Jane principles that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with is Ahimsa. Here's a definition from the Acharanga Sutra, and forgive my pronunciation if I'm, if I'm messing that up, which is the oldest surviving Jain text. It comes approximately from 350 BC. And in that text, it, 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 talks, it, it says that all breathing, existing, living, sentient beings should not be slain, nor treated with violence, or abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. Man, 350 BC. I mean, that, that to me is such a profound and powerful idea. And in particular, the extension of our circle of concern and our circle of compassion beyond other human beings um, to all living beings. I, I think that, that, that is such a powerful principle that we are privileged to inherit from the Jain tradition. Another Jain value is aparigraha, which I'm sure folks have heard of as well. Uh, and one way to define it, this is a scholar of Jainism, John Court, he, he summarizes it by saying, limiting either the value of various types of possessions or all of one's possessions in general. That too, given the way our economies are, are organized and given the amount of stuff that human beings have created and, and that, that constant consumption and production of stuff is part of what has driven the scale of destruction that's happening, I think this, this, this basic value that we have in Jainism that honestly is not that common across the different religious traditions, it's, it's, it's profound. And, and, and here too, I think there's a kind of prescience um, to Jain philosophy. Here's another one. Let me ask you guys, and you can just put into the chat, does anybody know? Oh, whoops, I, I meant to not <laughs> show you what it means. Okay, you can see what it means. Parasparo pagraho jivanam. Maybe just put in the chat so that I can find out, and I'm trying to find the chat, there it is. Um, if you have heard of that before, could you just put a little asterisk in the chat box? Let's see, I am clicking on the chat, but I'm not seeing it. Maybe I need to come out of um, full view, is that the issue? Oh, there it is, there's the chat. Um, yeah, I see a bunch of asterisks in here. Wow, I, yeah, good number of asterisks. I think that this is also a really crucial concept in Jainism, and it appears in the Tattvarta Sutra, um, which was written by Acharya Umaswami, and we don't know exactly when, but um, somewhere between the second and fifth century in the, in the common era. Um, and it's this idea of interdependence, that all life is dependent on other life. Um, 
<clears throat> and there too, I think it's just a really profound idea that actually underlies a lot of modern ecology, a lot of modern environmental science. It's also an idea that has come home so strongly during this pandemic, the, the interdependence of the world, that no matter how um, inward turning our politics has become, we are actually all dependent on one another. And if one country fails to take care of the pandemic, then other countries will automatically suffer, no matter how many borders you try to put up. And, 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 and the, the, the wisdom that is in the Jain tradition is that that interdependence is not just between human beings, it's between all living beings. And, and I, I, there too, I think we really have a powerful source of, of wisdom to tap into as Jain people. Um, so just to give an example of, you know, like how Jains try to put these ideas into practice, um, everyone's wearing masks these days, but, but masks go way back in the, in the Jain tradition. And some Jain monks wear masks all the time. Many Jains wear masks during certain um, ceremonies. If you have a hunch about why that is, could you drop that in the chat? Yeah, Jane says, so they to avoid living beings and killing kill living beings in the air, Sahil Shah, don't breathe on and kill living beings, to prevent killing, yes, 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 yes. Don't kill organisms, exactly, yes. Um, indeed, I, th I think the principle is actually not that different from the principle why we're wearing masks right now is we don't want to harm others, you know. In, in this moment, it's about giving other people the, the virus um, and here, this Jain practice is about not wanting to accidentally swallow an organism or not wanting to harm another organism without a breath. Um, and this is just one of many ways in which um, Jains have tried to take those lofty ideas and, and put them into practice in their daily lives. So let me ask a question to you guys. Um, how would you imagine applying those Jane ethics in the kind of personal choices that we make in this time, in light of the environmental crisis that we are in? Um, maybe, actually, if you'd like to say something, I think you could raise your hand or put in an asterisk and we can unmute you and we can hear from you. <clears throat> Vishwa, I will look to you to... Um... Yep, I uh, will work on unmuting people. Uh, drop an asterisk if you would like to answer. Sounds like Anand Shah, maybe? Yes, Anand, what, what would you... What, what are some thoughts that come to mind in terms of turning these ethics into real-life practices? Yeah. Um, I think a few that are being adopted by the Jain community right now might be mm -hmm. veganism, um, mm -hmm. might be uh, a really socially conscious policy towards like race or understanding interdependency mm -hmm. in terms of oppressions. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, general, right, like climate welfare, uh, supporting mm -hmm. policies that uh, look to preserve the climate or support the climate. I think these are a lot of the things that you're probably going to talk about and or that we have already talked about YJ today. Right, awesome. Um, that's great. This, thank you, Anand. And thanks for being here. And anybody else want to want to add to that? Looks like maybe Anady. Um, yeah, sometimes um, there's like a lot of trend in minimalism mm. and Jainism also has like principles like aparigya and um, just kind of limiting what we use. So that definitely applies to the environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely think that that is, um, you can see a clear through line from that idea of aparigraha and the idea of just trying to use less and walk more lightly on the earth. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could add to this list. I mean, I, and I'm I'm personally a little. I feel like I inherited some of that obsessiveness of the of the Jains. I'm not necessarily persuaded by all of the traditional practices that Jains have come up with. For example, personally, I have never I've never totally been convinced about the root vegetables. I, I I still eat onions and potatoes, but I do feel like I've inherited some of that obsessiveness, which I think which I really deeply admire in our tradition, which is basically to challenge ourselves, earnestly challenge ourselves. How do we live our values? If these are our values, what what does it take for us to live up to them in our daily lives? And I, I think that is an important call to all of us. Um, and I'm 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 a you know just to take myself for example, I'm lifetime vegetarian, sort of aspiring vegan, not quite there yet, and kind of in discussions with my wife and kids about it, but um but getting closer and closer. Uh, I ride a bike to work. Um, we put up solar panels, so we're 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 producing more energy than we consume. Um, we use a compost uh, service. We don't quite have enough room to compost ourselves, but we send our food scraps to a compost. Um, uh, to to a local farmer who composts the and turns it into soil. What else? I'm like that obsessive guy, somewhat annoying guy who like shows up with my own Tupperwares if I go to a restaurant because I don't want to get the the packaging. So I I and I I, I do I personally I, I hope I don't annoy people with those habits. I actually do feel like that is something special about Jainism that 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 earnest commitment to try to translate our values into daily practice. And I. I, I do think it matters, and I think it's part of being aware and alive in the world in a conscious way. And I, I, I support um, all of you in, in, in kind of pushing that as far as you can, like trying to think about your environmental, personal environmental footprint and reduce it. Um, one of the ones that I struggle with is flying is such a huge source of carbon emissions. And I fly a lot because my, my organization, we've got we have teams around the world. And so that's one that I, I kind of feel conflicted about. And we, we've looked at ways that we might be able to offset that, but th those are imperfect. Um, so yeah, I, I support that, that commitment to daily practice. On the other hand, something that I would really like to emphasize, and in a way, Anand, you anticipated this when you mentioned support for climate policies, is I just, then this is probably, if you take anything away from today, this is one of the things that I hope you will take away is, I think it's really important that we do not stop at those personal choices. In fact, if we do stop there, then I almost feel like they're a distraction because the, 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 the environmental crisis that we are in is a systemic problem. It grows out of the choices we have made, the rules we have set. And so reversing that destruction requires us to engage and change those laws and those institutions that shape our lives. No amount of personal behavioral choices is gonna get you there. Um, and another thing I wanna emphasize is that that work of rethinking and reshaping our laws and institutions, that is not something for politicians or lawyers alone. It really requires all of us. <clears throat> and I, I, would, I would offer that there are kind of, I see two really big lanes in which every single one of us, everybody on this phone can get involved in that process of reshaping our laws and our rules and our institutions so that they generate a reality that is more sustainable and so that we avert the kind of environmental collapse that those, those quiz questions were pointing to at the beginning. Um, and the first of those two is these sort of large scale political shifts. I, I mentioned earlier the Paris Agreement, which is so important, you know, having an international framework by which countries can work together. And then in the United States recently, there's talk about a Green New Deal. Um, and a Green New Deal is basically, the idea is that we would rapidly decarbonize our economy, so shift away from fossil fuels, and we would do so through a jobs program. So we would kind of tie together um, uh, again, the justice and the environment, like address some of the deep inequalities in our society at the same time that we address this, this urgent environmental crisis. So I think that there are ways in which all of us can be working towards those large scale political shifts. Um, I, I'm actually gonna spend less time on that because I actually think that pathway is a little bit better known. Um, I really recommend, for example, Sunrise Movement Maybe put in the chat if you already are a part of Sunrise Movement or have taken any actions with them. I'd be curious. They are a group of mostly young people who have um, really incredibly um, uh, spearheaded the Green New Deal and, and put the Green New Deal, 
brought the Green New Deal from something that was totally marginal to something that um, the majority of Democratic presidential candidates endorsed, for example. Um, I'm just looking in the chat. Um, I appreciate this point from Vivek Sangvi Jain about compassion and empathy towards every being, even in a politically heated environment. No estrus on, on, it looks like no estrus, right, Vishwa? On, um, on sunrise. So, so well, anyway, I, I'll come, I'll, I'm going to mention them later again, but I think they are a great group to link up with in regarding this first pathway about working towards these large scale political shifts. And they do have chapters in most cities and towns, certainly big cities around the country. <clears throat> the second pathway, and this is the one I want to uh, spend some more time on, is how do we work towards stewardship in the places where we live, locally in the places where we live. And so I don't just mean our personal choices, like do you compost or you know, do you do you do you drive a car or not? But I mean the 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 rules and decisions that are shaping the places where we live. Um, and I want to give an example of what that work looks like. Uh, let's see. Can anybody guess what this is? Maybe just drop your answer in the chat. It looks like I need to exit full screen in order to see the chat, but hopefully you guys can still see the picture. Let I me know if you can help can... call out things in the chat. What's that, Vishwa? Uh, I can help call out things in the okay. chat. If... Okay, yeah. People yeah. tree somewhere in India. Palitana. 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 That might be a people tree. People tree. Um, a village somewhere hot and humid. Is it a mine? We're getting closer. Anand Shah and Rishi Zabedi. Quarry, getting closer. It's actually a, um, it is actually a bauxite processing site. And some, you know, people were guessing India. And indeed, someone said, Palakana, this is indeed Gujarat. And in particular, Saurastra. Some of you may have family from Saurastra, which is sort of the, the, western corner of Gujarat in the center, just south of Kutch, which is where my family's from. Um, and so there's a bauxite mine somewhere else. The bauxite mine is dug up and then brought here. And then here it is um, basically crushed into fine particles. And then we're close to the coast on the right side of the photo. You can't really see it, but it's basically the ocean. And so from here, uh, the bauxite is getting crushed and then put on ships for um, export and for, for transport. And what you can see in the foreground of the picture is that there is a village literally under the shadow of this bauxite processing facility. There's a, this, this one little lane, and then I'm standing on someone's terrace taking the picture. Um, here are four ladies who are with me on that terrace. It's one of their homes, Jileka Ben, who's the one in purple. Kulsum Ben is the one in red. I have blacked out their, their eyes just because um, uh, there's some danger in, in, um, in, in what they have done. Um, and these ladies, they, they said to me that they would do their laundry and hang it up to dry. And before the clothes were dry, they would be covered in that red dust from the, from the bauxite. Or that they would go to prepare food for their kids. And by the time they would feed their children, the food would be covered in that, in that bauxite dust. And there's a, there's, a, um, there's a doctor about an hour from this place who saw a dozen children with kidney stones from this one very small village. And if any of you are doctors or medical students, you would know that kids are supposed to get kidney stones and have a dozen from a small village. Um, something's deeply wrong. And indeed a kidney stone can be a side effect of really harmful air pollution. Um, so th these, these folks were living with a, a, a circumstance that no one, no one should have to. And, and Kulsum Ben is the one in the red. One day, she actually sells vegetables from a cart. So she's particularly exposed because she's kind of out on the street. Um, and she just was having a hard time breathing. And she went out to the facility. And as you can see, it's kind of open. So that there's not really a barrier. She, she was able to walk out there. And she talked to the young guys operating machines and said, can you guys slow down? I mean, we're having a hard time breathing. And um, one of the ones she talked to, instead of slowing it down, 
he started using his machine to lift up the box and slam it down on the ground even harder, almost to spite her for having the guts to speak up. Um, and she said to me that at that moment, she just, something inside Kunsum Ben just snapped. She went back to the village. She got these three ladies and about a dozen others, and they went running out to the site, and they picked up stones and started throwing stones at the machines that were processing the bauxite. And, and they said that the guys who were running the machines, they just picked up their chapal and, and like ran away. Um, and the place got shut down for two weeks. And then after two weeks, it, it started up again. Um, and the, 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 one of the key facts is that the contractor who runs this facility is a member of parliament, he's an MLA, so he's a member of the Gujarat Legislative Assembly, and he's an extremely powerful guy, and people are scared of him. And that is why historically, until that particular moment when Kulsum Ben lost her mind, no one had complained, no one had done anything about this. Um, and there is a guy named Hasmuk, this is his picture, who works as a grassroots community paralegal, a grassroots legal advocate. He works with Namati, the group that I run in this region. He's not, he's from, a, he's from, um, he, he, he's born and raised not too far from this village. And he had his eye on that facility. He knew that the facility was a huge source of pollution, but he hadn't been able to find anybody who wanted to do anything about it because people were afraid of that uh, very powerful contractor. So when he heard that this thing happened, that these ladies had, 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 had thrown these stones and that the place had gotten temporarily shut down, he went and sought them out. And he said, I, I, I really admire that you had the guts to do something when everyone's been completely petrified. And I'm sorry that the result that you got was not, was not lasting. But if you are willing to try, I have another path that we could, we could go down. I have another road that we could try. And that involves using the law. And they said, okay, we're game. And so what Hasmuk did was he helped them get a hold of the basic, it's called the environmental clearance and the consent to operate. These are documents that basically come from the government. They say the facility is allowed to operate, but it has to follow certain conditions. Um, and these people have been living next to that facility for decades, but they have never seen those pieces of paper, which are the conditions under which that facility is operating. Not only have they never seen them, they're in English, and, and these folks don't speak English. Um, so th this is an example of how you can have laws on the books, but they are useless if people don't understand what they say and if, if they're not accessible. And so what Hasmuk did was he translated those permits into simple Gujarati. And immediately they could see that there was big gaps between uh, what was written on paper and what was happening in practice. And they used that information to approach their local pollution control board officer for that region. They put it, they gathered the evidence and they wrote in a complaint. And this is not a lawyer representing them. This is the community's members representing themselves with Hasmuk's help. And at first the, the, the pollution officer just sort of ignored it, but then they went and visited him and said, we live here, come and see it. We want you to see with your, with your eyes. And he did go. And then at that point he wrote a, an order um, to the company saying, you need to comply with these regulations. Indeed, there are violations and we want you to comply with these regulations. What do you think happened next? You can, you can say so in the chat. What do you think happened next? But Meta said, they didn't comply. Vic Sumi says, um, hey, Mayur Meta, um, political trauma. <laughs> They closed up, leaving everything open. Um, those are all good guesses. What happened was someone said nothing. That's what happened. Nothing happened. The contractor, you know, he's a powerful guy. He's a member of the Gujarat Legislative Assembly. He took that piece of paper, threw it in the trash. But the communities did not give up. Hasmuk did not give up. They traveled to Gandhi Nagar, which is the capital of Gujarat, and they met someone who's a couple rungs above this regional officer. And they said, look, your own officer has issued this order, but the company's in non-compliance. They and they completely ignored the instructions from your own officer. And at that point, that more senior person um, what, uh, issued a closure notice, actually saying that the company needed to shut down until um, it was in compliance with the regulations. And receiving that closure notice from the state capital, even the contractor took that seriously. And so then guess what happened? I'm gonna show you the next slide. 
I'm, when I took this picture, it was about a year after I took the first one, I'm standing on that same exact terrace. Let me show you for comparison. This is what was there when I went there the first time. And this is what was there a year later. They cleaned up that box site. And the, the ladies, Kusum Ben, Jileka Ben, they were like, we can breathe again. We can breathe again. We can do our laundry. The clothes aren't red before they dry out. We can feed our kids. And it doesn't have the bauxite masala on top. Um, and we have immediately experienced uh, a lifting in our own sense of, uh, of health. Um, and perhaps even more important than that physical remedy, um, Kulusum Bed said, said to me, I'm not afraid anymore. You know, I now know that there is law on my side. And that in some ways is really, I think that, that, that transformation from despair and fear on the one hand to hope and determination on the other hand. That is, I think, at the heart of the struggle for environmental justice. Um, so, uh, and, and, and it's not that the facilities shut down permanently. They, the, the company has committed to uh, complying with the regulations, which includes they have to build a whole go down so that the whole thing is happening indoors, so the, that the, the, the dust isn't just um, uh, flowing over to the village. And ultimately, when these ladies protect their own village, they are protecting all of us because um, pollution doesn't stay in one place. That pollution affects everyone. And so there's a way in which these struggles that happen locally, they actually add up to um, uh, the conditions that, that, that shape the planet for everyone. Let me just, I would, you know, and just the thought on that kind of legal empowerment journey, it started with an impact where the, the ladies felt a lived impact, like we can't breathe. And then part of what HUSP helped them to do was to understand that impact in terms of the law and to see that there was actually a violation, that there were rules in place in which, uh, which, which this, this facility was violating. And then armed with that knowledge, they engaged the institutions to pursue a remedy. And that, that legal empowerment journey is something that honestly, I think every one of us on this call could engage in in our own places. I will just give one more example. I realize I'm, you, I'm going a little slower than I had hoped, um, and I want to save time for discussion, but can anybody guess what this is or where? Put, it, put your answer in the chat. <clears throat> where did the chat go? South Bronx, somebody said. Coal, yes. New York, it's actually not New York, not Oakland. LA, Kijang says South Bronx. Wow, says Atman. Yeah, it's Baltimore. I live in DC. This is like an hour from my house. And um, indeed, those are open piles of coal, completely open piles of coal. I mean, it's not that different a picture from the earlier one that I showed you from, from Saurast. Um, what do you see in the foreground of the photo? Exactly, yeah, children, children playing basketball right across the street from open, these are about, it's hard to tell the scale, but these are like three story tall open coal piles in the city of Baltimore here in the United States with no covering, no protection. And there's a whole neighborhood, this is Curtis Bay in particular, of people who live across the street from this coal and they should not have to deal with that. They should not have to, to live like that. <clears throat> and coal in general, from a climate change perspective, we should not be, mining at all. In fact, this, this coal is mined in West Virginia and um, is being put on ships and some of it goes to India. It's a very dirty form of coal um, called net coke. And India is one of the few countries on earth that will actually take it and use it. Um, and just like Husmuk, there's a guy, his name's Terrell Askew, um, who's born and raised in Baltimore. He's not a lawyer. He's, 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 he's a community member. He's received some training from us. And he is working to engage a very similar process, get a hold of the, here it's not called the clearance letter, it's called the clean air permit and the clean water permit. Get a hold of those documents, explain them to community members, figure out where there might be legal hooks to take action, and then work with people to get a solution to this polluting situation. And the thing that people say is not that different from Kulsum Ben and Jileka Ben were saying, which is, I can't breathe. The, the rates of asthma and respiratory disease in this neighborhood are twice as high as the average for the city of Baltimore. And this was data from the Public Health Department of Baltimore. And then Baltimore as a city, which is a largely African-American city, 
is 50% higher than the national average. So you, you can see the environmental injustice. You can see how the environmental harms are concentrated on people who are less powerful in our society. Um, so coming back to my um, story here, how, so, you know, there's Terrell, there's Husmuk, but how could all of us, every single one of us on this call, how could we advance environmental justice, advance stewardship in the places where we live? I actually think it's pretty simple. The first thing to do would be to look for the environmental harms. Like, where are the open coal piles near where you live? And if, if you have any questions about how to find those, excuse me, um, we can, we, I, I can talk more about, there's some simple ways that you can find, find out about where the harms are, or are there environmental opportunities? Is there a vacant lot that could be reforested? Is there a park that needs protection? Get to know the people most affected, you know, like get to know the people who live close by, the, the, the Jilika bands and the Kulsum bands. <clears throat> Find out what the rules say. Do what Husmuk and Terrell did. And those rules, um, they, they belong to all of us. We, we should not be afraid of them. Find out what the rules say. And again, we can talk about the, practically how that, how that works. And then together, try to search for a solution. You do not have to go to court. I mean, the, the, um, the institutions that have the power to enforce these rules, most of them are what are called administrative institutions, meaning you do not need a lawyer to go before them empowered citizens, community members themselves, just like Jileka Ben, Kusum Ben, Hasmuk, Terrell, they can approach those institutions directly and, and demand a solution. And then drawing on that experience, whether you succeed or not, join hands with others to advocate for better rules. Because we know that the rules we have on the books, they're hugely unenforced. And actually in DC and Maryland, where I live, there are hundreds of facilities, which if you go to the EPA website, you can see that they are in non-compliance. So, so we're, we're not living up to the rules we have, but we know that even the rules we have are not sufficient. But that experience of trying to solve problems and take on violations, it can be really valuable in, in envisioning and advocating for what better rules should look like. And for example, what a Green New Deal should look like when you get down to the details. Um, and you know, what I would say to sort of conclude is that if all of us know law, use law and shape law, then we can forge a deeper version of democracy. And we can, we can forge a version of democracy that lives up to those Jane values we were talking about at the beginning, one that places people and planet above profit. Um, I wouldn't want you guys to do this alone. There are some amazing groups out there, uh, and I've just listed some of them, that you can go on their websites and actually have them pulled up if anyone wants to look right now together, and you can find out where's the chapter close to me um, so there, there are, there, you, don't, you don't have to be alone in this. You can find groups to work with and you don't have to be doing this for a job. This, this can be um, your evenings, your weekends, um, your lunch hour, whenever you have the chance. Um, and so I think with that, uh, I would love to just open it up and see if people have uh, questions or observations or reflections. I think what we'll try to do, but Vishwa, feel free to um, intervene, is you could just put it Esterisk in the chat if you would like to say something. Okay, and we want the Slido route as well. So either, either Vishwa, should we say either or, or would you prefer people to use Slido? Yep. Um, so I think Ronak has a comment. I just unmuted him. Okay. Go for it, Ronak. I had a quick question. So I see like new technologies, like uh, electric cars are starting to come out. Yeah. yeah. Do you think electric cars could drastically help climate change, like limit climate change. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, great question. Um, I do think in general that technological advancement is one of the crucial frontiers for overcoming this massive crisis. And some of you may be engineers or technologists, and I think this would be a really exciting field to work in. Electric cars is one, but they're, 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 I would put it even broadly, like we need to figure out how to um, store solar battery, solar power better. There's a lot of innovations required in relation to battery storage for solar power, for example. Um, and there are some interesting experiments around carbon sequestration Though the, the best way to sequester carbon is through trees. You know, tree, tree, trees are an incredible um, 
natural version of carbon sequestration, but there are some other interesting technological developments. So, I mean, I, I would say yes, EVs, electric vehicles, and, and more broadly speaking, technological advancements are crucial. But I, 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 um, I don't think we can rely entirely on those. They are necessary, but not sufficient. And I, I, I do believe, and, and this has you know, come through from years of grappling with these questions, is that we're not going to find a pathway out of this crisis unless we really remake our rules and systems for environmental governance. And we need to do that from the ground up, which is why, in particular, I am encouraging all of you to take part in those questions of justice and accountability and law and violations. Find the, find the problems where you live and try to get the institutions to, to, to answer to, the, to, to, to address those problems. If we can't remake our systems for governance, I don't think that any, any technological innovation is gonna save us. Yeah, a great point from Nirali that um, some of the technological solutions, they themselves involve harmful environmental impacts. Uh, that's true of most of them, uh, that they, for example, she was mentioning that they increase the demand on certain kinds of minerals, um, and so, yeah, I think the, the, the technology is important, but it is not a um, savior and that we're going to have to rethink the way, we, the way we live and work and relate to one another and, uh, and, and, a, and a really powerful way of, of engaging in that rethinking is by starting with the problems and the, the, the challenges of stewardship in the very places that we live. Vivek, I think there's uh, some questions on Slido that have been uploaded, so um, okay. people are dropping them in throughout the session, so I want to ask some of those. So um, this is from someone anonymously. How do you stay okay. motivated and persevere <laughs> to bring about change when the law isn't on your side? Mm. Right. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, and certainly, I was giving the example from Gujarat where the law was on their side, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the rules are actually designed to repress. And so how do you stay motivated? I mean, I think I would go back to that quote from Bishop Tutu. I mean, he lived most of his life under apartheid in South Africa. So the law was clearly not on his side. And he will say to you, and he's one of the most happy people. Um, if I, I, I've met him, and if you, if you encounter him, he's like just so deeply joyful, almost childlike in his joyfulness. And he, he will say to you, you know, it's not optimism because this is a pretty dark time that we live in. It's just that I'm a prisoner of hope that, that um, I don't know any other way to live. And I think one of the things that keeps me motivated is these, these community paralegals and these community members that we, that we work with around the world, watching their courage and their perseverance is part of what um, drives me. Um, yeah, and I, I think, um, nothing uh, generates hope like action. So if you, if you take these sorts of steps in the place where you live, just having that path, having that, that, that praxis, that, 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 um, that activity, that pathway to do something, that I think is part of where hope comes from. That's a great answer. Um, I think another question that people wanted to have the answer to is what can we do to help with environmental injustice in remote regions while we live in urban regions in the US? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a disconnect there. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, that, that's an interesting question. Well, I mean, one thing I would say is that the urban places that we live are not at all immune to environmental injustice. I mean, I gave the example of Baltimore. I live here in DC. Here, let me show. Do I still have? Am I still sharing my screen? Um, yeah. Yep. So look, just to give you an example, if you're looking for, because part of the, you know, the first step I offered was find where the problems are, and the mm -hmm. EPA, for example, has something called the Echo database, which all of you can use. It's open to the public. Again, you don't need to be a lawyer. Can you see this, Vishwa? Here's the Echo database. Yes. And if I put in Washington D.C., which is where I live and I ask, what are facilities that are in um, significant violation of their existing environmental law? And these are facilities, th these, this is based on, see right here where I'm pointing, it says compliance has significant violation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and these are facilities on, based on their own self-reports that they're, admit, they're admitting that they're in significant violation of their environmental law. And you press search. Um, whoops, I didn't want the map view. Let me give you the list view. So this is basically like a search engine to help you find facilities in your area that might be not compliant. Not exactly. Compliant. And if you, if you, if you, exactly, Vishwa. And if you, if you press search, there are dozens and dozens of facilities right close. I can ride my, my bicycle to them. Um, for some reason, it's, here we go. Uh, I realize we're running out of time, but yeah. So, which is, this, so I guess one answer would be, no results were found. You're kidding me. I just did this before we got on. So I must have clicked something wrong. But there are dozens and dozens of facilities in significant violation within biking distance of me. And I bet it's true for you too. Um, and this is one way to search. Another way, there's one way to, to, to find out where those problems are. Another would be to connect with these sorts of groups in your place. What is the local um, Sierra Club chapter? What's the local Sunrise Movement chapter? Waterkeeper Alliance is another awesome one. And you can search for water keepers in your region. The Legal Empowerment Network is actually something that Namadi convenes, the group that I started, and there are legal empowerment organizations in many, many places who, have, who are part of that broader community. There are also local organizations that aren't necessarily connected to something bigger. Terrell, who I showed you his photo from Baltimore, he's part of something called United Workers, which is exclusively based in Baltimore that focuses on environmental justice issues. So I think one, one answer to the question would be start with the stuff that is close by. I do though think that it's an important point that ultimately we wanna to build towards solidarity across rural and urban, across America and India. Um, and I think in a way, starting with problems at home is a step towards that larger solidarity. Um, and so for example, the Green New Deal movement, ultimately that is a kind of uh, change that would affect all of us positively. And so that's one way to be in solidarity with people in rural areas is to work together towards a bigger change like that. <clears throat> what else do we have? Um, let's see. So maybe, so, you know, one, one thing is like, how can we make an impact in the communities that we live in? Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe the rural communities outside. But there's a question here about how, you know, there's a lot of smaller things that we can do in our daily lives. Um, mm -hmm. Things like um, I guess consumerism falls into that, that highly impact our carbon footprint. So how do you suggest kind of going about narrowing that carbon footprint um, or changing our habits? Right, that was, you know, we, we, we sort of started in that place. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some of the simple, oh, I did want to shout out, there's a great document that was adopted by Jaina just a few months ago, late last year, called the, let me get back to my presentation here, called the Jane Declaration on the Climate Crisis. Um, and I really like that document in part because it straddled the two things that we spoke about today. So there are a number of things that are along the lines of personal um, changes that you can make in your own life, but then they talk about much larger structural issues as well. Um, so there's some examples in this, in this Jane Declaration on the Climate Crisis, but I mean, some big things that come to mind are use a car less or not at all, right? You know, see if you can live your life on a bicycle or by walking more and, and on a car less. Um, uh, composting rather than setting food scraps in the landfill, reducing your use of single use anything, single use paper, single use plastics. Like um, we just, single use was sort of like a, a misstep I feel like for humanity. I know when my parents came here, they were like, what is it with Americans? Everything's disposable. You know, even the marriages are disposable. Um, and we need to get away from disposables. Um, so those are some that come to mind immediately. But I think what I would, what I would, what I would go back, and veganism, I, I, I totally support that as well. That's something that's core to our tradition and that um, uh, is, a, is a way of uh, trying to live our values. But I would go back to this, the, to this idea that I don't think that only focusing on those personal choices is sufficient. I, I really think every single Jane should be doing these two things, um, working towards large scale political shifts, things like the Green New Deal, and then working towards stewardship in our own communities. I, I believe that if we are really wanna be true to those powerful principles that we have inherited from our tradition, then, then all of us should be doing what we can to advance these two, these two aims. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a really good note to end on, um, a call to action. 
and there have been some pretty interesting comments in in the comment box in the chat box as well um so i think with that um thank you so much let's give a huge uh, huge virtual round of applause to vivek <laughs> maru for sharing his story um i'm gonna share my screen really quick thank you guys <laughs>